Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. No matter where you happen to be around the world, my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park, Alaska. This is live footage of brown bears fishing for salmon. And during today's play-by-play -play broadcast, I'm joined by my co-host, park ranger, Chris, Chris Kleesrath. And Chris, um, looks like it's going to be a good evening for uh, the bears. It's been a good day overall. Lots of bears and a lot of fish for them to catch. It, it does, Mike. It looks like there was a lot of uh, fish jumping and quite a few bears at the falls. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about tonight. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's pretty late in the year for, you know, having this many bears and salmon at Brooks Falls, but we've been seeing, you know, that sort of thing over the last several years compared to historical averages, at least. So that might be one on our topics of discussion today. So again, like I mentioned before, this is live footage from Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park, Alaska. We have the main Brooks Falls cam at our disposal today, but we also have other cams that we can take a look at as well, such as a bear's eye view of the waterfall it's called the Falls Low Cam, if you want to ever watch that. And then about 100 yards downstream, we have the Riffles camera. We also have uh, three cameras near the river mouth. This one looks upstream from the river mouth. This is called the river watch camera. We also have the lower river camera, which looks down towards the outlet of, of Brooks River into Naknek Lake. And then we're going to go underwater from time to time to look at the beautiful salmon that are hanging out in that area. And if it's not too foggy on Dumpling Mountain and uh, it comes up maybe in conversation between Chris and I, we'll go up to the top of Dumpling Mountain about 2,000. 400 feet in elevation right above the river itself. I know there's a lot of people who are, you know, tuning in to the Get Bear Cams maybe for the first time. So as I always like to do during the beginning of our broadcast, let's take a quick tour to show you where Brooks River is in relation to the rest of the world. Uh, Brooks River, Brooks Falls, located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, it's in the west central portion of Katmai National Park, and the river is bisected by Brooks Falls, and along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at the river. The signal from those webcams is sent up on top of Dumpling Mountain, the view that we were just looking at before, to a couple of radio repeaters there, which is signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. It's quite a challenge to get the signal in and out of Brooks River. It's actually really amazing that we have this opportunity to share the bears and wildlife with everybody. So I'm, I'm pleased every time that I have this, uh, this chance. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to share this experience with everybody. And these are the locations of our different cameras. So again, on the left-hand side of the satellite image, Brooks Falls and the Brooks Falls camera, just downstream of there are the riffles, and then the various uh, lower river uh, cameras. Each one of these gives us a different line of sight. The Brooks Falls cam mostly going to be focused on that immediate vicinity of Brooks Falls. Every once in a while it might look downstream and give us a view that's looking downstream a few hundred yards. And then the Riffles looks from the that 100, 100 yard mark downstream of the falls upstream to the falls itself. And then again at the lower river we can look outwards towards the outlet of the river in Naknek Lake. Our river watch camera looks upstream to uh, the north and the under, or excuse me, to the west. And the underwater camera uh, looks, or is very close to the river watch camera attached to the floating bridge and it is looking downstream. We also have uh, a few questions that we're gonna try to answer during our broadcast today. Those are submitted in advance through the Ask Your Bear Cam question uh, form. And if you want to ask us questions in advance for any of our live events, you can find the link to that in the partner tab on the left-hand side of the page below any of the brown bear cams on explore.org. So look for that there. And we're also gonna be talking about individual bears. So if you wanna learn more about many of these animals, download the free Bears of Brooks River 2022 book off of Katmai National Park's website. You can find that at nps.gov slash K-A-T-M or just search for Katmai eBooks and it should be the very first Chris, let's go back up to Brooks Falls, though, for a moment, um, because we have a couple of adult males fishing uh, in the far pool of Brooks Falls. Looks on, uh, looks like on the far side, number 801, 
munching on a salmon there. And then one of the more recognizable and more famous and more beloved bears right in the middle there of our, our, scene, our screen, that is a uh, number 480 Otis. Otis has been doing a fair amount of fishing outside the office this year and uh, looks like he's keeping up that trend. He's, he's been doing really well, uh, catching a lot of fish and spending a lot of time uh, in the water, just eating those salmon. He's put on quite a bit of weight. I think he's gonna do really well this year. Yeah, his belly's hanging pretty low. We can get a good look at that right now. And that's uh, an indication of how well fed he's been over the past month and a half or so, at least as long as he's been fishing at Brooks River uh, this summer. One of the interesting things about the bears at this time of the year too, Chris, is how much they've changed in appearance, not only just like in body size and body mass, but also their fur color is changing. Uh, Otis, he tends to be kind of light brown when he shows up in late June and early July, and the bears are in the midst of shedding last year's fur. Almost all of it's gone right now and growing in their darker uh, fall and winter fur coats. And Otis seems to be getting some of those kind of light patches of fur that he has on both of his shoulders. And that makes him kind of recognizable, I think, going later into the, uh, into the summer. For sure. Aside from that ear that everyone is so in love with, um, that kind of is a little wonky, I think the shoulder patches help us identify him as well. And we don't know why bears might have, certain bears have those shoulder patches. It, it's not every bear that has one. Uh, but Otis has some pretty distinctive markings on his shoulder. That's one of the ways I think that you can, yeah, like you mentioned, Chris, you can tell him apart besides that wonky right ear that he has. He has a bit of a floppy right ear. But that, that right ear, interestingly enough, actually stands up a little bit, I think, in the fall compared to early in the summer, maybe because he just gets fat uh, and he gets like, it's just a little more buoyant in, in that sense. Uh, so uh, Otis, if you're not familiar with him, he is perhaps... Uh, one of the oldest adult males that we know of at Brooks River, he's in his mid twenties. We don't know exactly how old he is, but he is a very patient angler. He's very skillful. Um, and a lot of people love to watch him. He doesn't tend to get in many altercations with other bears. He just tends to kind of do his thing. Um, and I think maybe that uh, has paid off for him in his longevity. He, he definitely suffers from ailments that old bears suffer from like broken teeth and worn down teeth and missing teeth things like that. He could be suffering from arthritis and other things too. Old bears get that kind of stuff. Uh, but Otis, yeah, again, doing really well for himself and proving once again that he's a survivor. I think this laid back manner makes him uh, much more popular with some of our bear cameras. He's just out there to feed himself. He's very seldom aggressive with any of the bears. Uh, they just like to watch him sit in his office and even more recently be just about anywhere on the falls catching some fish. He's been pretty... Uh, you've been able to see him just about everywhere this year. And overall, the, the bears at fishing at the falls are fairly mellow at this time of the year. I think there's just a lot of fish available to them. Uh, so the competition for productive fishing spots isn't as intense. And also these bears have been encountering one another on a daily basis for the past you know, month at least. So they know each other really well. And uh, familiarity in this context is very advantageous because the bears don't have to work out the hierarchy. They know who's aggressive. They know who might be subordinate. Uh, they know how much to give each other space. That's not to say there won't be conflict between bears at this time of the year, but it's much less frequent than it is at the beginning of July. And that, that's a clear difference that I see every year on, on the bear cams. In late July and August, there are far fewer sort of like fights and, and uh, physical contact or even just like aggressive encounters between bears compared to the beginning of, of July. That's so true. And if you look down the corner, the lower left corner, you can see all kinds of fish jumping. I think it's, uh, they're starting to head upstream a little more. And when the shot was a little further back, um, you could see a lot of fish jumping on those falls. So they have plenty of opportunity to catch some fish. We have a good view of that on the uh, falls low cam right now. So big bear number 747 in the plunge pool that is called the jacuzzi. That's one of the most productive fishing spots at Brooks Falls. And I know our cam op is actually panning downstream because it got a uh, tip that um, maybe a mother bear and her yearling cub are in sight. So I think we're gonna take a look 
at them right now um, because it's just not, you know, big adult males that fish at Brooks Falls or in the vicinity of Brooks Falls. It's also younger bears, single females, and also mother, a few mother bears and their cubs. And the, Chris, this might be, just looking at it, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this might be number 909 and her yearling. So this is a, a mother with the, her first known litter. Uh, and she's doing pretty well for herself and her cub this year. And, and he's, he or she is doing uh, very well as, as well. You can see that he's put on some weight. Uh, they, they've both been very active at the falls and doing very well. And I, I agree, I think it's 909 and her yearling. Last year, at the beginning of summer, when 909 showed up with a spring cub, I, uh, I think she may have had two at the beginning, if memory serves correctly. And for some reason, you know, one of them disappeared. We don't know why. That's not uncommon for um, for mother bears to experience uh, mortality rates for cubs in certain places of the park and certain ecosystems throughout North America can be pretty high overall. Uh, and, you know, when you're a first time mom, <laughs> I think, it, you know, maybe the process is a bit more difficult. You're trying to, you know, feed yourself. You're trying to adjust, though, to the needs of your offspring and protect your offspring. And 909, you know, made that adjustment, even though it seemed to be a kind of a tricky process for her. And you can just look at the size of that yearling and how pudgy it is. That is a, that is a sizable animal um, right now. He's doing really oh, well. And this, um, she's she, yeah, and this, she's a young mom. And, oh, she just stole a fish. <laughs> well, and this is interesting too because the, these um, two adult females here are two different families that we're looking at right now. This, um, number nine zero nine on the left, and number nine ten just downstream. These are sisters. Our sisters. So, um, They're sisters. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we have cousins of of bears on the river right now. So when you have uh, nine tens yearling. Uh, you know, uh, or excuse me, nine ten spring cub. That's a first year cub down by that log there. And then we have uh, number uh, nine ten, or excuse, I'm getting <laughs> sorry, nine zero nine and her yearling up closer to the camera's point of view. So sisters very familiar with one one another. It's kind of interesting to see how these families react to one another. The cubs probably aren't very familiar with each other though. But Chris, I'm convinced that um, bears remember each other after family separation in many years afterwards. So I don't know if these two um, mother bears will come any closer to one another, but I, I doubt we'll see them actually act aggressively towards one another. They, they seem fairly comfortable with each other. I would say they probably recognize each other. They're both pretty young and first time moms. Um, like you said, the uh, 909 had two last year. The cub mortality for younger and first time mothers is much higher than uh, when they get a little older but they both seem to be doing very well with the cubs they have and um, really tolerating each other really well in close proximity right now. Yeah, fascinating to watch. One of the interesting things about watching bears at Brooks River is that we get to see multiple generations of bears coming back to the river. That is something that we talked about, I think pretty extensively in our um, you know, mothers and cubs live chat that we did just a, a few weeks ago. So, and sometimes people often wonder, you know, do they recognize each other after family separation or does mom recognize her cubs after family separation? And I'm certainly convinced that they do. Most of the time they sort of ignore each other. Uh, but sometimes, you know, especially when the recently separated offspring is young, mother bear might try to uh, reinforce family separation if the, uh, the offspring of hers gets a little too close. And Chris, I think that is a good segue for a clip that we had, actually a couple of them that demonstrate this. So we're gonna cut away from live footage for just a moment and go to a highlight that I pulled from the cameras. This happened just a few days ago. So um, we're gonna talk about Holly here and her uh, recently separated two and a half year old. So Holly normally separates from her cubs at uh, at the age of the, when their cubs are in their, their third summer, the beginning of their third summer. So along at the mouth of Brooks River, just a few days ago, um, her two and a half year old, who we see running uh, through the frame right now was near Holly. And as these bears get closer to one another, we'll see Holly is not quite keen on reuniting 
uh, the family overall. And I, Chris, I don't know if you were able to see this with Holly or other instances or with other bears this, this summer. I did witness it with Holly, um, 435, uh, down on the lower river uh, once or twice that she was actively reinforcing the separation. Uh, and then at times would be tolerant, kind of reinforce it and then kind of say, all right, look, you know, it's okay, you can stay close, but just don't come any closer. Um, we did witness another, which I would be lying if I said I knew which one, a sow with two cubs, uh, two and a half year olds that uh, ran those off as well near the falls, but off the cams um, and was rather aggressive running them off. Uh, but I don't think they've tried to reunite as much as uh, Holly's cub has here. And you'll see her, I think she'll run her off in a little bit. Um, this is down, I think, off the spit. But what I witnessed was more in the marsh over by the, a little bit uh, upstream from the bridge. And sometimes I think uh, it, you, you can wonder whether, like, the, the separated offspring is trying to, like, just kind of, latch on to mom once again. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the actual case or not, or if it's just like, hey, I remember you. And, um, you know, I benefited from being nearby. And I remember you being really tolerant to me. So maybe I'll just kind of try to hang out. But, um, you know, this this um, two and a half year old here kind of pushed the boundaries near Holly, who is normally very tolerant of other bears. Of other bears. Um, so it was, it's always a little bit of surprise to see Holly sort of express um, her uh, maybe uh, her frustration with <laughs> with uh, um, the, the close proximity of another bear. So we had, you know, that little run earlier in this clip and then Holly really given that, that bear a good charge. That was a full on charge in that situation. And the other bear wasn't hurt. The smaller bear wasn't hurt, it just kind of ran away. Uh, but I think it got the message for just a little bit, but it didn't get the full message though, because uh, let's, uh, Go to uh, the uh, next clip here. Uh, Holly again with uh, the two and a half year old nearby. So the, on the, in this view, the two and a half year old is on the left hand side of the screen. Holly is walking through the river on the right. Very recognizable behind and on her. So and that that two and a half year old is just sort of like hanging out and doesn't get out of the way as Holly is approaching pretty directly here. That may have been the one I witnessed. I, I was surprised that the cub actually even stayed around for another shot. Uh, you know, she, she ran her up pretty good, but she still kind of stayed around. And I wonder if it's not the same thing that we were witnessing with 910 and 909, where um, the cub is saying, hey, uh, I'm, I know I'm comfortable with you. I, I'm not going to bother you. I just want to stay kind of close. Maybe she feels protected. Um, and, but Holly just doesn't seem to be having having it anymore. And eventually, it seemed like, um, you know, even there's several of these situations happened where Holly kept charging the two and a half year old and the two and a half year old will back off. It will kind of come back. And eventually, I think Holly was just like, oh, whatever, kid, you're going to hang out, but I'm not going to help you. Um, maybe that was the <laughs> the motivation um, or, or her mindset. Eventually, she just kind of got tired of it um, overall. I think we discussed earlier, though, that you've seen this behavior in Holly before, haven't you, with uh, previous cubs that she separated from? Uh, yes, I have. And uh, it's that was interesting for me to see. Let's cut back to live footage here uh, of Brooks Falls. Uh, I did see her behave that way with number 89 backpack when he was a two and a half year old or a three and a half year old. I can't remember exactly the year. But so she has that. Um, that inner even though she's an extremely tolerant bear she does seem to sometimes want to reinforce that family separation so the the mother or the bond between a mother bear and her cubs is, is extremely strong when the family is together but that bond is temporary so after the cub is separated and goes on its own uh, there's no happy family reunion and that definitely is in um, mother's uh or holly's life life history uh, last on our last play-by-play, -play, though, I think uh, we showed a, a clip of Holly ignoring her grown offspring, uh, number uh, 89 backpack, when they were fishing in 
somewhat close proximity in the far pool of Brooks Falls. So they sometimes, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, go about their businesses. I think especially as they mature, both of the bears mature into the full grown adults. And, and even then, I think they may recognize each other and just see the other one as non-threatening and just can coexist next to each other, especially when there's this many fish. Yeah, very relaxed scene at Brooks Falls right now with all of the different bears that are catching salmon, feeding on salmon. It doesn't seem like, uh, you know, many bears are going hungry today because of all of the, the fish that are available to them. And Um, the bear right in the middle of the screen on the webcams earlier today. And I think that might be number 907. Not 100% sure on that. I don't know if 907 has been around uh, the, the falls area yet this summer. But looking at him this year, he is like, if that is 907, he's like a spitting image of, of, like, of 856, like a mini 856. And we don't know, you know, the the paternal line in brown bear analyzing DNA because male brown bears pay, play no role in raising offspring and females can mate with several different males during the mating season. But boy, you know, this bear just with the, like the eye rings and the shape of his ears and the color of his ears and kind of how he holds his ears, that's all, that whole facial region really does remind me a lot of 856. And he's a very dominant bear on the river. So I would not doubt if he has, you know, many offspring running around. Uh, just checking my list of, and this is maybe a week or two old, that as far as I know, 907 may not have been seen yet at the river. If so, it, I haven't seen him. So it's possible that it's uh, 907 that we're looking at right now. And he does even have a little bit of the blonde tips on his ears like 856 does. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of his offspring. It's always interesting to speculate who is, you know, the dad of, of these bears, but we don't know in almost all cases just because it requires DNA analysis. So that's going to be a mystery, I think, for a lot of uh, a lot of years because there's no analysis planned for the for the bears. But the maternal line, you know, that's a little bit easier to track because we can look at um, mothers with their cubs, and especially as the cubs grow into yearlings and two and a half year olds, um, they develop fairly prominent. Um, or diagnostic physical features that allow us to tell them apart. And again, going back to our Falls Low Cam here, we have um, number 909 on the left with her yearling and very in very close proximity to uh, 910, who is sister of 909 and uh, that spring cup. Now both the 910 and 909 were 409's offspring, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And I think they both have mom's ears. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Bead Nose. I should have thought of that ahead of time. But 409 was nicknamed Bead Nose. She has not been seen in several years. Uh, so we don't know her fate. Uh, she was, you know, about a 20 year old bear or so when, when she was last seen. So not too old for a brown bear, but, you know, uh, not, not very young either. But Beadnose had very big, poofy ears, and she loved to fish the lip of Brooks Falls. And we'll see both of these bears um, doing that. Uh, so they seem to be following in mom's footsteps. So we'll have to we'll have to keep an eye on these, especially is that nine, that's nine ten with her little one. He's been growing leaps and bounds, giving that nanny tree yeah, he, uh, the babysitting tree or run for its money. Yeah, he's a pudge. And it's it's been fun to watch him sitting on the edge of the uh, edge of the falls, hanging out, being ex extremely cute, um, just sitting there digesting his earnings uh, from mom's milk or from the salmon that, uh, you know, she lets him have or her. I'm not sure if, if that's a male or a female cub. Um, often that cub will climb a tree near the edge of Brooks Falls as well and be very safe up there. And mom can just kind of like hang out on the lip of the falls and catch her fill. If you're wondering, uh, you know, about telling 909 and 910 apart, uh, we can show you a couple of quick pictures here. So this is number 910. This is from a few years ago. So she's grown since then, but she has very poofy pom-pom shaped ears, but they're more brown in color than the very poofy pom-pom shaped ears of number nine zero nine so that's a couple of ways that i tell them apart i not only can you look at their 
their offspring and uh, the relative age and size of them. But also you can look for the, uh, the color of their ears. Otherwise, they, they, you can almost tell that they're, they're related individuals. They do look very much alike. They certainly do. I, I never got the opportunity to see 409 bead nose. She was already gone when I arrived in 2019, but they tell me they're very, very similar. Yeah, they. In my opinion, they are. They they look just so much like um, their mother, and I'm really glad that you know sort of her big nose's legacy is continuing on the river. There's a few, uh, or at least one other bear, I should say, that a lot of people suspect could be an offspring of 409 bead nose and uh, 717, I believe. Uh, and I can see the family resem resemblance in that bear as well so bead nose could have you know more than just um 909 and 910 running around the river as offspring i just got a note saying 907 has appeared at the falls and on the river so he is back so it's possible okay, great. that's who And Chris, another indication that the bears are, are doing well and, and well fed is um, this play fight that we're looking at on the River Watch camera right now. The bears seem to really love to play in the water when they're well fed, especially the young bears. Um, you know, the, the water helps to support their bodies. So they don't have to work as hard uh, when they're playing. And it's off uh, right next to their food source. Sometimes one of the few things that breaks up a play fight is like uh, one of them will notice a dead salmon on the bottom of the river and they'll be like, no, oh, I'm going to eat this. I'd rather eat, eat now than play. I'd love to watch them downriver, especially the sub-adults. Uh, they will play until they get exhausted, and then they'll go fishing because that's where the dead and dying fish are, and then they'll play some more and go take a nap. They're, they're wonderful to watch at this time of year, especially as it gets a little later and there's more and more fish downstream. Sometimes in television or on movies, you might see a play fight presented as an actual fight. Uh, they'll end up dubbing over like roaring sounds and growling and things like that. Uh, but you can tell the difference between a real fight and a play fight just by looking at the relatively gentle nature of a play fight. Um, so how the bears aren't locking their teeth onto one another, which is some, when they're fighting, I mean, they grab and they tear with their teeth. Um, the movements are much more quick. They're more violent um, and, and it's overall, it's just more intense and it's a shorter duration of an interaction. Uh, fights are exhausting for bears. They're exhausting for people. Thankfully, I haven't been in a physical fight for a long, long time. <laughs> so not since I was a teenager, at least that, that I can remember. Uh, but uh, but it, it's, in, you know, when you're, if, even if you've ever like tried to wrestle somebody, it's pretty intense. Um, so, you know, for, for bears to be fighting, it doesn't last very long. Um, the most intense fights and prolonged fights may, may only last a couple of minutes or so. So if you see something going beyond that, then you'll know it is uh, uh, probably a play fight. It's good. It's good learned behavior. It's, uh, it's something they need to work on for when they interact later on. Um, in fact, I think we have a live chat on that next week about subadults. Yeah. So tune in for that. Uh, Ranger Chris and Ranger Kim will be hosting that. And uh, yeah, they'll be talking about those juvenile bears that are so interesting and fun to watch because they're exploring their world. They are trying to find their home range and establish their home range. And it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's the life of a teenage brown bear. So it'll be a, a fun chat for everyone who can, who can tune in. Back up at the falls, number 480 Otis has moved from the far side, just a little bit closer to the, the camera overall and um you know otis is one of those bears that we're not really going to be seeing in a play fight he seems to really just um do his do his own thing although there was maybe one time in the last few years where he sort of jawed with another bear in a, in a playful manner but overall he's just like i'm just gonna go focus on fish that is what i'm interested in that's how i'm gonna make a living uh, 
and you know he's a, a master of, of energy economics he he moves very slowly very efficiently and that's i think that's how he gets so fat despite you know maybe being one of the older bears on the river it's definitely working for him again this year Look at They're the fishing on the lip of the falls right now. Yeah, look yeah. at all the fish I mean, that is, you know, just kind of incredible for this time of the year. That is not something that I saw at, when, during my first few summers as a ranger at Brooks River. It, you know, August was a slow time of the year. Typically by, you know, the first week of August, there were very few bears around the river, if any. And, um, and not a lot of salmon migrating through at that time of the year. So the bears would disperse to different locations. And many bears have done that. They've dispersed to different locations to fish for salmon in other places, but there's still so many fish coming in that it's, uh, you know, it's keeping a lot of the bears around. And we've seen that for the last several years. You know, one of the first things I heard in 2019 was that the bears leave in August. They kept telling me the bears leave in August. So, um, and Quite a few hung around and they they told me that there was more than usual so i was rather pleased and same thing in 2020 um so i think maybe because of the way the salmon run is going this year that they may be uh, a few more in august than we think they were going to be absolutely and i was hoping to get to our underwater camera here just in time to catch a bear swimming by and i think it was just out of frame uh, but there are some Looks like some whitefish or, or long nose suckers swimming through the water there. We'll often see a lot of salmon um, from this view as well. So it's a, it's a wonderful view to look at if you're looking for, um, you know, a different perspective on the river itself. And going, you know, speaking of salmon, going back to the waterfall here, Chris, um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game counts the number of salmon that enter the Naknek River watershed, which Brooks River is a part of, but they stopped counting uh, once the run sort of like traditionally slowed down and almost uh, stopped. And that was like the third or four, uh, third week of July, fourth week, week of July this year. And I think they ended up counting about 1.9 million fish, which is a very strong salmon run for the watershed. And that's certainly within um, sustainable boundaries. That's what they're aiming for when they're aiming to manage the commercial salmon fishery so they don't catch too many salmon. But I wonder if that escapement is an undercount just because we keep seeing salmon pushing into Brooks River and trying to migrate upstream. And these are still sockeye salmon. They're not like um, like pink salmon or coho salmon or another species that arrives a little bit later in the summer. These are still very large numbers of sockeye salmon. So I wonder if you know there have been well over 2 million fish moving um, into the Naknek River watershed and maybe you know several hundred thousand fish in total um, you know, moving into into Brooks River this year. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And that's a great sign for not only our bears, but the entire Brooks River ecosystem to have so many salmon return every every year like this. Um, it'll help our, our bears get their caloric intakes that they need to gain the weight, especially uh, when later in the season when they enter hypophagia. And there's a nice looking specimen of a salmon right now. Um, and so it's good that, that so many are able to return and that the, the run is so strong. And if you're just tuning into our broadcast, my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. We're looking at live footage of brown bears fishing for salmon at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. And my co-host for this play-by-play -play is park ranger Chris Kleesrath. Uh, Chris, we have had, um, as we look at this bear on top of the falls, maybe number 99, um, not completely sure about that, um, you know, with uh, showing off his skills, we've had uh, questions about um, number 910 on the lip of the falls. Again, that's the mother bear that we were looking at earlier. I think actually she's still downstream right now. Um, on the falls low camera. So she's still hanging out with her spring cub. But when she gets to the top of the falls, she does kind of a, a peculiar uh, thing. And 
Let me bring up the one an example question that people have been uh, asking about her, and we'll talk about sort of like her peculiar habit on the lip of Brooks Falls. So somebody was wondering, nine tenths behavior while fishing on the lip is unusual. Do you have any concerns about her health? So let me pull up a clip here of what that just might look like when she's on the lip of the falls. So Chris, she, you know, we've, we've been talking about this together. You know, she's been doing this kind of weird, um, exaggerated, like head twist and turn and throw. Um, and she does this, you know, repeatedly when she's fishing on the lip of the falls, but we don't see her doing it in other locations on the river. I know people have been speculating about, you know, could there be some sort of neurological disorder? Um, but, you know, you and I, I think both agree that maybe that's not the, the case. I, I think it's more of a habit than anything else. Uh, you know, you have some bears that, you know, if you remember back, the ones that used to lick a lot on the lip or uh, raise their paws up before the, while they're fishing. In fact, she's doing that right now. Um, I, I think it's more habit than anything neurological. Um, she does it quite often, but I, I don't think it's a sign of anything wrong. And it's a new thing that she developed too. Uh, she didn't, I don't think she did this in the past when she, or even like er, in early summer. I don't know why she's doing this. I, uh, but I agree. Yeah. I don't think it's some sort of neurological disorder. I think it's probably just like a weird habit that she picked up. Maybe it's uh, because of anticipation when she's trying to, you know, uh, she's so excited to catch fish and she, so she just can't control it. Maybe there's something else going on. She's not the first bear to do this, however. So um, I want to uh, bring up another clip here of, let's head back into, uh, restart this for everybody. This is from 2010, this is number 415. And the camera is a little shaky here. Uh, this is a handheld camera at the time, pre bear cam days, but she was a bobblehead when she was on the lip of the falls. And she, you know, she didn't throw her head back uh, in an exaggerated way like, um, you know, number 910, but she did do it uh, a lot. So she's not the, uh, 910 is not the first bear to do this on the lip of the falls. There, famously, there was a bear um, nicknamed Head Bob, who we saw at Brooks River for close to 30 years, uh, or at least into, uh, you know, more than 25 years. And he got his nickname because he would bob his head up and down frequently when he was standing on the lip of the falls. And curiously, we just don't see bears, you know, doing that in different locations. Um, again, going back to maybe number 99 here on the Lip of the Falls live footage, uh, we just don't see, you know, 910 doing that in, in different spots, Chris, which I think indicates that it has to do something with, with that spot on the lip. I think it's just in with her method of catching those fish. It works for her, so she does it. I mean, that's just my opinion, but I think, um, I think she's fine. And again, we don't really know that for sure. Uh, you know, we, to, it would be difficult to diagnose any sort of like neurological disorder in a bear. Uh, I know some people have been speculating about like mercury and things like that and whether the bears, you know, have too much mercury in them. And Chris and I were trying to do some cramming for, um, you know, the play by play tonight to get some, uh, some idea about how you know mercury content might affect bears and bears in you know southwest alaska and on kodiak island can have fairly high levels of mercury in their blood because they are eating so many uh many salmon so uh you know whether that has health effects for them is just not known um but i think uh it, it certainly underscores the need to make sure that we keep our air clean because if we're pumping up mercury into the atmosphere, eventually it's going to fall into the oceans. And where do the salmon get big? Well, that's the oceans. And they bring that mercury back up in the fresh water for the bears to feed on. But if it, Chris, we were both talking about how if it was, you know, um, you know, something that affected 910 through mercury or some other heavy metal contamination, then we would be seeing that behavior in other bears and we just don't see it. Yeah, exactly. Any anytime we, we've seen exposure to high metal contents uh, in water um, supplies or anything like that, it, it seems to affect the population as a whole. Um, we don't see that behavior in anyone, um, any other bear than her. And even if it was a different type of neurological 
causing a different neurological problem. I think you would see something in other bears if that was a primary cause of her head bob. Right, because it's just not like 910 eats more salmon than other bears. Uh, if, based on just her, you know, her body size and position in the hierarchy, she's probably not eating as much as like a bear like 856 and 747 who might eat um, thousands and thousands of pounds of salmon uh, during the summer. So, so yeah, I think we would probably see it manifest in other bears overall. Well, we did learn a few things, Mike, reading that stuff today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always fun to dive into the literature and the questions that we get from the audience really keep us on our toes. So thank you for all the questions that people um, do submit because it helps us learn more about the brown bears. A couple of, um, again, more a couple of bears play fighting in the river mouth right now. Uh, actually, four bears now that we see um, a couple others within our line of sight. So um, more play fighting going on, more well-fed bears having uh, having a good day at, at Brooks River. And and for me, Chris, it's always fun to see bears play fighting and, and experiencing a little bit of joy. I don't think it's anthropomorphizing to say that bears, you know, feel some joy at some level by participating in, in this behavior. They definitely look to me like they're playing. And in that area of the river, although um, the river is high, and uh, has been moving fairly quickly in that area of the the mouth there right as it meets the lake it's fairly shallow so as you can see they're standing up it's not very deep but they can wrestle around and swim and fish uh, to their heart's content uh, and it's a really good spot for them uh, to, to to learn things it's also a spot where a lot of bears encounter one another um, in somewhat close proximity not necessarily as close as the falls because they have the choice to avoid each other a little bit easily uh, or more easily than what uh, they do at the falls but sometimes they'll come into close proximity and there was a really interesting interaction not that long ago chris with um and let's pull that that clip up so this is from uh just a couple of days ago i believe of number uh nine 10 here, um, the mother bear that we were looking at earlier in the broadcast with her yearling, and then um, Holly's separated offspring, who we're also looking at in a, in a clip from earlier. And it's, it was interesting to see this um, interaction, very friendly interaction between that independent two and a half year old and that yearling bear. And a lot of times mother bears are not tolerant of you know another bear approaching their offspring, but we saw an example of it right here. And it's nice to see uh, they obviously again are, are playing she must feel comfortable with the with the cub the separated cub and uh i think that yearling is very happy to have someone to play with uh, i guess that's anthropomorphizing too um but you don't see it very often but i do see it sometimes i've actually seen family groups that will interact with each other uh where the cubs are playing so again it's not where it happens all that often but it, it does happen It goes to show how tolerant the bears are of one another and what familiarity or how familiarity can provide advantages uh, to them. And, you know, 909 now is going to lay on her uh, on her back and let her yearling nurse with that that subadult bear um, in, you know, immediate vicinity. So, you know, obviously 909 is not concerned about any potential threat that um, the subadult, the blonde subadult could pose. And uh, again, that's, that goes to show that familiarity is important. Um, bears are really good at reading each other's body language as well. And the familiarity between these bears might not have established this year. This could go back to last year uh, with, um, with Holly when she was raising that blonde, that blonde bear. Maybe they had, you know, interactions, somewhat friendly or tolerant interactions along the river. And they remembered that and that led to what we're seeing right now. Yeah, we have seen Holly's cub uh, before she was separated the last summer and the summer before even um, playing with other cubs. So I don't think it's unusual for her, but uh, I've never seen it with, with uh, 909s, but they seem to be pretty comfortable together.
So let's head back up to Brooks Falls to live footage here of our bears making a living fishing for the dozens of salmon that are jumping per minute. And again, always wonderful and remarkable to see this. Uh, the salmon in Brooks River are part of the Bristol Bay run of sockeye salmon, which is the largest sockeye salmon run on earth. And it's really the last great salmon run on earth. And this year, the overall run in the entire Bristol Bay region in Southwest Alaska, uh, exceeded 76 million salmon and that is an all-time record it, it it didn't just beat the last record it just smashed it by maybe 10 million fish or something like that so things are booming in bristol bay um and it's it's wonderful to see because climate change is hammering salmon habitat loss is hammering salmon in different parts of north america so salmon runs in a lot of places aren't doing very well but they are doing quite well in, in Bristol Bay and, and the bears are just one of the many, many beneficiaries. Yeah, we, we tend to focus on the bears and the salmon, but as, as we've talked about before in our salmon chats, they benefit the entire ecosystem. They fertilize the trees, they, they feed the birds and uh, other small mammals, and um, they are really valuable to the entire Brooks River and Naknek uh, ecosystems. Or Bristol Bay, not just Knack Knack, but Bristol Bay ecosystems. The salmon really do uh, reach ac across every strand of the food web from the microorganisms that live on the bottom of the river and help decompose their, their bodies after they spawn and die to, you know, the top of the food chain and the brown bears and the people of this area. Well, we just had a live chat about bear culture and the the bears, both the bears, the people of the Bristol. Sorry, I think my audio may have dropped for just a little bit, Chris. But yeah, I was just trying to emphasize how both the, the bears and the, the people of the Bristol Bay region are salmon centered. These are salmon centered uh, cultures. And I think, um, you know, it's one reason why people admire bears because they have so many similarities with us. Um, and, and they're, you know, they, they focus on salmon, um, you know, just like uh, the people uh, of, Brist of Bristol Bay. They've been part of the culture for, for thousands of years uh, in the whole entire area. So, um, Value, values the uh, salmon and what they contribute to the entire region. This isn't necessarily on the topic of salmon, but it's a question that um, that somebody brought up for us. Actually, less of a question and more of an exclamation. Uh, but it's a, an interesting one to to talk about. Um, this person was uh, wrote, "I was wondering about the evolution and functionality of a grizzly bear hump." Exclamation point. So definitely wanted an answer there. Um, you can see different brown bears have uh, different sized humps, but that's one of the physical characteristics that separates a brown bear from polar bears and also black bears. Uh, brown bears and polar bears are extremely closely related. They can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, but brown and black bears have been separated, I think, for probably a, a few million years, at least, um, even though they're, they're fairly closely related. Um, but they have a shoulder hump. Brown bears have a shoulder hump on them. Sometimes it can be very prominent in certain bears. Sometimes it's not so prominent. Uh, but that uh, is supposedly a, a mass of muscle. And also it has to do with the shoulder blades too. I have a friend who's always talking about how the shoulder blades play a role in that as well. But it's a big mass of muscle and, you know, it's connected to their, uh, to their scapula. Uh, and that mass of muscle helps them um, to maybe dig and, and grasp uh, things. So um, they live in more open country where digging could be more important, especially if you're digging up a lot of roots and tubers to eat. So uh, yeah, it's, it's probably just an adaptation that helps them to survive in open country environments where they're doing a lot of digging. And Chris, that's also combined with their claws too. When you're at the river standing on the platform, you can look down and just see how massive uh, their, their claws are. Uh, you definitely can, especially when they've got a fish in there, in their claws, um, making a meal of it. Um, and what I've learned as well has been that the, the claws and the hump are ad adaptations for digging, either not only um, dens, but also food um, 
to supplement the salmon. And in inland, of course, um, there are no salmon. So that's how they get a lot of their food is to, to be able to dig it up. Yeah, it's, it's important to, you know, always remember that what we're witnessing at Brooks Falls here is fairly unique. There are other waterfalls in North America and other places in North America where brown bears fish for salmon, but there's no place that I know of where, a, where bears go to a waterfall and they can fish for salmon the whole entire summer. Uh, for example, 747, who's kind of just on the edge of the frame on the right hand side, uh, not quite in the jacuzzi. He got here in Chris, uh, I think in June, right? You know, he might have showed up in June. I think he was, yeah, he showed up pretty beat up uh, in June, at the beginning of June or so. But he's, again, he's yeah. doing really well and catching lots of fish and gaining lots of weight. And he's been, you know, fishing at the falls every day this year. He has really not left. His home range at this time of the year is extremely small because he can just sit in the water and catch fish after fish after fish. And other bears are, you know, watching him and learning. They are, they're trying to, you know, find their own way of making a living. Some bears love to fish on the, the lip of the falls. Some will try to innovate different, different locations down below. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's fun to watch different bears do things in different ways, but this is, yeah, again, a unique situation uh, where you have bears being able to sit at a waterfall for months on end. And, and catch salmon. I, again, I know of no other place in North America or the world where this happens, where bears are fishing from June until really October at the exact same um, fishing spot. Uh, so yeah, really amazing Go, uh, underscores just how many salmon are available to the bears. I'm sure you've witnessed it as I have. Um, and I've got a picture of 747 where he's been in the jacuzzi fishing all day. He definitely outlasts me at the falls um, and then goes over it and has a nap on a rock. I've got a picture of him with just sleeping with his head on a rock where he'll sleep for 45 minutes to an hour and then go right back into the jacuzzi and eat the rest of the day. So he does stay in the water all day, very often by the jacuzzi. Um, and from the time he shows up in June. They like to take naps in the river. You know, you've seen Otis do that as well in the office. He'll eat and then you look over and he's, he's sleeping right in the water. He doesn't even bother to get out. And why would you, I guess, you, you know, if you're not bothered by the cold of the water, which the brown bears don't seem to be, uh, they seem to have, you know, a, a physiological tolerance for being in cold water all the time. They're very large animals. Uh, their body fur probably doesn't provide them with all that much insulation, especially when they're soaked to the skin. Um, so their, their body fur is not thick enough, like an otter, for instance, where it's going to repel water and keep water away from their skin and trap air next to their bodies. That doesn't really happen there. It's mostly just like their body size, their body fat that helps um, to keep them warm. And then also, I think they just might have a, a higher tolerance for it than people, for sure. There's no way that I could be in this water more than a few minutes at this time of the year without getting chilled. Even though it's the height of summer, water's still fairly chilly at most. It's probably in the low 60s, um, especially since you, you've had a pretty cold summer up there. It has been very rainy and very cool. So I would imagine that river is well, I've, I've stepped in it before. It's, it's still pretty cool. I think this uh, bear down below might be number 164. Can't get a really great look at uh, his face, um, obviously from the, the position that he's uh, standing in. But 164 is a bear that likes to fish at the base of Brooks Falls and really sort of invented this fishing spot for himself. Up until he started doing that, um, last year, we really had never seen a bear fishing in that particular fishing location. So it, it takes a different maybe skill set than fishing, um, you know, just slightly downstream at the edge of the plunge pool where you're waiting for salmon to bump into you and you're kind of feeling uh, for salmon to bump into you under the water. Um, you know, when you're standing at the base of the falls like that, you're, you're looking to maybe either catch salmon jumping up or if they miss the jump and they're coming down in the, in the right direction for you, then you can catch them on that downfall. And he's had some interactions with Grazer when she's on the lip or even 747 sometimes when he's in the jacuzzi, but not all that often. So it seems to work very well for him in that spot. I believe that is 164 Bucky Dent. Um, 
so he he makes it work for him and so he just returns there just about every day and it's really yeah it, it's a spot that he invented for himself um uh, you know he, he's taken a liking to it he returns there frequently and he's not like the largest bear at brooks falls there are certainly many other bears that are quite larger or quite a, a bit bigger than him so if he was trying to compete with like say otis in the far pool or 856 in the far pool or 747 for the main part of the jacuzzi then he wouldn't have access to those spots but he found a place and he's making it work so it's really great uh to see that um example and he just did it um right there so great catch you caught that one midair that's a that's a that's a an impressive skill you know these salmon are perhaps five pounds on average they could be larger they could be a little bit smaller but imagine i always like to use like sort of this analogy imagine somebody picking up a five pound bag of of baking flour uh, from the grocery store covering it with fish slime and then throwing it at your face and and then expecting you to catch it in your mouth you know a person wouldn't be able to really do that <laughs> especially at the speeds um, that you know the salmon are leaping out of the water at but the, the bears have the size they have the strength they have the teeth they have the tools uh, to do it so it, it's an impressive thing every time that they do it Chris, we're coming up right at the on the end of our broadcast here. This play-by-play uh, -play really flew by because there has been um, so much activity, so many things to talk about. Uh, has there been anything in particular that has stood out for you uh, today? I've just been really interested in the whole interaction between Holly and her separated cub, uh, wanting to be so close to her and, and Holly just not being very tolerant. Um, I've witnessed that in person and, and uh, I've been interested in your views on why you think that's happening. And um, I did learn that it, it's, she's exhibited this behavior before. So um, the separation between the, the mom and the cubs has always interested me. So it's uh, especially fascinating to watch it uh, with Holly and her cub. And, and there aren't many observations of, you know, mother bears physically separating from their offspring. There's a little bit of it in the scientific literature but you know we we rarely see it at brooks river most of the time it happens before the bears start to gather at um at brooks falls so you know the more you know observations of this and we can capture on the webcams i think the greater understanding we'll have of that very important event in a bear's life and it's one that you know sets them on a, a road to to independence and for me, you know, today, you know, watching how the bears show different levels of tolerances for one another, seeing um, number 909 and 910 in such close proximity to one another and looking at the, how Holly reacts to her separated offspring and the, all of these different family relationships that we're getting to witness on the river. It is really kind of a, a remarkable uh, thing to witness. And it looks like it's even getting busier at Brooks Falls today. So as we conclude our broadcast here, if you want to continue watching bears, just go over to explore.org right now or any time that you want to um, watch brown bears fishing for salmon at Brooks Falls. Chris, thanks so much for joining me today and sharing your insights. Um, thanks so much for having me. And I think I'm going to hang around a little bit and uh, keep an eye on these bears. Looks like we've got quite a few more than when we started. So I hope everyone has a good night. My co-host for this play-by-play uh, -play broadcast has been park ranger Chris Kleesrath from Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for watching today. And until we talk to you again, enjoy the brown bears. <laughs>